Welcome to MD Insights. Today we have Dr. David Rosen, who is a colorectal surgeon, uh, who is a member of the Digestive Disease and Surgery Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. So Dr. Rosen, you're a colorectal surgeon. Uh, how did you get interested in that? Yeah, when I started out in general surgery residency, I didn't know exactly what uh, field I would be interested in. And that's one I, that really just attracted me when rotating through even beginning as an intern. Uh, what I like then and still like about colon rectal surgery is, one, it's something different every day. There's lots of different procedures we do. We do laparoscopic surgeries, open surgeries, outpatient anal rectal cases like hemorrhoids and fissures and fistulas. I uh, do colonoscopies. So there's lots of different ways to uh, keep myself entertained. It's just a good variety. In addition, I think the problems that we take care of as colorectal surgeons are, are sometimes some of the most intimate issues that patients can have when, and things that are awkward to talk about, such as difficulties with bowel function. And it's, I take pride that patients confide in me some of these things that are the most, you know, some big social distressors and, and that I can help fix them. Great. And, and how did you make your way to Cleveland, Ohio? So I did my general surgery residency in Los Angeles and uh, my colorectal at the University of Southern California and my colorectal surgery fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. And then I'd gotten to know Dr. Brad Champagne and Dr. Scott Steele through uh, meetings and they approached me about a job opportunity and came and interviewed and, you know, I, I fell in love with the job and my wife and I really enjoyed at Cleveland having never been here. And so we... Here we are, been here ever since. Great. So one of the things I thought we would talk about today is diverticulosis and diverticulitis. So what's the difference between those two? Yeah, so diverticulosis is the presence of having uh, diverticula. And diverticula are outpouchings of the colon wall uh, that, you know, over time when there's different pressure gradients and pressure segmentation as the colon contracts, you can develop these diverticula. It's quite common, the majority of people in the country have diverticula or diverticulosis. When you get a microscopic perforation of one of those diverticula, the resulting inflammation and, and disease process that occurs is diverticulitis, meaning inflammation of those diverticula. And that's the, diff the, the difference. Okay, and should uh, a person know or have symptoms of diverticulosis? Diverticulosis can often be completely unrecognized and you might have it your entire life and never know it. Really the time that you will get uh, symptoms is when you develop an episode of diverticulitis or complications thereof. Okay. And let's say you have a routine colonoscopy for screening and you're the person who's doing the procedure, either a colorectal surgeon or a gastroenterologist says, oh, we found diverticulosis, but nothing else. Is there something patients should do to either prevent that from getting worse or prevent diverticulitis? Yeah, there are some things that we know are associated with the development of diverticulitis. So whether you have diverticulosis or not, they're all the things that you want to be doing are making sure you're having good physical activity. Uh, we know that sedentary lifestyle can, can lead to the development of diverticulosis and diverticulitis. There's some evidence that avoiding red meat um, uh, and tobacco sensation, uh, cessation, excuse me, stopping smoking, uh, those will all help prevent uh, episodes of diverticulitis. And we think perhaps also that increasing the fiber and having a high fiber diet uh, will help prevent attacks of diverticulitis. And it's just a good idea in, in general because it's good for your colonic health. Is there a certain amount of fiber we should be taking every day? As a minimum, you want to try to get to 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day. Um, and that's you know, often difficult with the Western diet to get there. So oftentimes a fiber supplementation of a psyllium husk or another fiber is a good idea to get you there. Okay. And I, I did notice that the, the rates of hospitalization for diverticulitis have gone up over the last uh, several decades, actually, particularly in young people. What, why do you think that is? Yeah, it's a disturbing trend that we've seen and a similar one we've seen in colon rectal cancer as well. Some of the risk factors are uh, similar between the two. Uh, some of the things I, I referenced before, so we have you know, an increasing obesity epidemic, which is contributing. 
Um, you know, I think poor diet and low fiber, low fiber intake uh, in the, you know, the Western diet with the processed foods and the um, uh, high fructose uh, corn syrup, those all play a role. I think people that are smoking have a higher risk. Um, just all things that, you know, you generally want to live a healthy lifestyle, exercise, don't smoke or drink, um, uh, avoid excessive amounts of red meat intake and eat a high fiber diet. But diverticulosis itself doesn't cause diverticular, it doesn't cause colon cancer, does it? That's correct. There's no association necessarily. Just because you have diverticulosis does not mean you'll, it's a risk factor for for colon cancer itself. Okay. So let's say you have an episode of diverticulitis, unfortunately. What's the standard treatment for that? So diverticulitis, you can divide, and it's important to distinguish between uncomplicated and complicated diverticulitis. Complicated diverticulitis is when you develop as a result of an episode of diverticulitis, something such as an abscess, which is a pocket of infection, a fistula or a connection from the colon to the bladder or vagina or skin. Those types of, when you develop a complication from diverticulitis, typically that requires a surgical resection to remove that portion of the colon, as that's unlikely to get better um, and stay better in the long term uh, without surgical intervention. Uncomplicated diverticulitis, meaning you haven't had any of those uh, complications, you get pain, you come into the emergency room, a CT scan shows there's inflammation, but no abscess or other complicated um, sequela. Then those we often manage non-operatively. Uh, with antibiotics, and you know, in, there's even more recent data that shows maybe antibiotics aren't even necessary. So, when it's uncomplicated diverticulitis, oftentimes you do not need surgical intervention. But the care of diverticulitis really needs to be individualized. If someone has multiple episodes over time of diverticulitis, um, and it really becomes bothersome to their life, um, then that's a time even for uncomplicated diverticulitis, you might need surgery. So let's say a patient comes into the emergency room, has uncomplicated uh, diverticulitis and goes home. Which one of those patients should come and see you as a colorectal surgeon? I think it's important for anyone with diverticulitis to come and follow up with a colon and rectal surgeon or a gastroenterologist or someone that's going to follow them. What, what's important after an episode of diverticulitis, regardless of whether it's uncomplicated or complicated, is you want to make sure you get a colonoscopy if you haven't had one recently. And that's something that you want to speak to your physician about. Because if you, what we want to make sure is, one, that the diverticulitis has, um, has resolved and that that is the diagnosis. It's rare, but sometimes there are, you know, as many as 5 to 10% of times, there can be what's hidden and thought to be diverticulitis actually could be a cancer. So it's important to get checked after the diverticulitis resolves and make sure that there's nothing else going on. And if you have an uncomplicated course of uh, diverticulitis, you have a normal colonoscopy, how likely are you to get another episode? Yeah, great question. The, the, for uncomplicated diverticulitis, there's really the, uh, the mantra we talk about is the first is the worst. And that's really why over the past decade or two, we've shifted to such a non-operative course uh, for uncomplicated diverticulitis. Most patients' first episode is the worst one that they encounter, and subsequent episodes um, that do occur are sometimes mild or asymptomatic. So even though your risk of a second episode is, is definitely less than 50%, you, you, know, you might want to, um, uh, or you can take some relief in the fact that it's likely that it will be less bad than your first episode. Okay. So let's say you're an unfortunate patient who has to be admitted for complicated diverticulitis. Um, should a colon and rectal surgeon be involved in your case always? Yes, I think, I think absolutely from the start, it's important to involve a, a surgeon uh, in the case for, divertic for complicated diverticulitis because we can really help, you know, set the stage and sort of lay out a map out a timeline of how things are going to go. In the short term, we like to try to get through the episode of complicated diverticulitis without immediate surgery and defer the surgery uh, till later on. And what that means is if there's an abscess, uh, sometimes we can, if it's small, it can be treated just with antibiotics. It might need a percutaneous drain placed by our interventional radiology colleagues. And after we're able to calm everything down um, in terms of the infection or any complication, then in the future, we can do an elective surgery. The benefits of delaying the surgery and doing it in elective fashion 
there's a greater likelihood that it can be treated laparoscopically or minimally invasive uh, or robotically, some minimal invasive type of surgery. So smaller incisions, it's less pain and quicker recovery. And there's more chance of avoiding an ostomy. Um, two things that are you know great for patients. So what would be the common indications that would require a surgery during that initial hospitalization? Yeah, if, if you attempt a trial of non-operative or conservative management with antibiotics or drains, and the symptoms is, are not improving, uh, you know, pain is worsening, any hemodynamic factors such as heart rate or blood pressure are worsening and getting unstable, or um, the patient's abdominal exam becomes concerning, that is a failure of non-operative management, and then you will need an urgent surgery on that same admission. And how often would you, if you require emergent surgery, in, that you would, could still do it laparoscopically, would you say? Um, I would say, for me personally, I would say probably about 70, 50 to 75%, I'm still able to do laparoscopically with a, what's called, it's a sort of a hybrid approach as a laparoscopic hand assist approach. Um, but those almost certainly will require, because of the uh, fecal contamination, at least a temporary uh, ostomy. And we, we sort of didn't talk about this earlier, but the portion of the colon that's typically involved with dip, diverticulitis is which, which portion? And how, if you have to do emergency surgery, how much of the colon typically needs to come out? Yeah, great question. It's almost always the sigmoid colon which is the last part of the colon before the rectum. Uh, the reason for this is this is kind of the, where the muscular wall, there's a lot, usually a lot of muscular hypertrophy, and that thickening of that sigmoid colon likely contributes to you know, pressure contractions and causing those outpouchings of the diverticula. The sigmoid colon, the length of it varies, um, but typical, a typical resection ends up taking about a foot of colon, removing that entire sigmoid colon. And you, you mentioned the possibility of a stoma, how does how does that decision happen in surgery if a, if a stoma is required? Yeah, so it really depends on uh, a few things. There are patient factors. Is the patient uh, very sick and unstable and you need to get out of the operating room quickly? It, is the patient on um, immunosuppressive medications such as steroids? Uh, is the patient malnourished and doesn't have very good nutrition? All those things would contribute to a not good or to, to a lack of healing, and therefore it's not safe to do an anastomosis or a connection at that time. So those are some patient factors. There's also intraoperative factors that you would look at. Is, the, is there a lot of gross contamination of stool? Is there so much inflammation to the colon that this, the tissues are very weakened and they just simply won't hold uh, any stitches or staples? Those are times that you need to do an ostomy. Uh, let, every, let the infection clear, let the tissue settle down, and then in the future you can come back do a second surgery and get rid of that ostomy. Okay. Let's say we're back to an elective situation where uh, a patient needs an elective colon resection for diverticulitis. Are there relative advantages or disadvantages to laparoscopy over robotics or vice versa? Great question. Uh, the short answer is no. I think, I think what's most important is that your surgeon is doing um, what they're most comfortable what the surgeon's preferences, whether their training is more inclined for robotic versus laparoscopic. We know that outcomes for colonorectal surgery are essentially equivalent uh, in both those minimally invasive fashions, laparoscopic or robotic. So it's really just more important to have a conversation with the surgeon. Um, and there might be certain aspects of each case that would favor one or the other in each individual surgeon's hands. And are there good data looking at uh, quality of life outcomes with surgery after diverticular disease in general? Yeah, so th there, there are some data. Um, it's, it's obviously, you know, retrospective and, and not the largest. But for the most part, people are typically very happy after they've had uh, surgery for diverticulitis, mainly because the patients who undergo surgery are ones who have had really severe symptoms and been dealing with it for a while. Um, you know, the main thing we worry about with any uh, colorectal surgery, including that for diverticulitis, is that we're going to change the bowel function and that that connection that we uh, create might leak. Uh, that creates a bigger problem in terms of infection, and that might overall affect their long-term quality of life and bowel function. Most of my patients, what I would say is, is a 
people who, after I do a sigmoid colectomy, remove the sigmoid colon, about 60% of them, I would say, have, you know, six months down the road when their bowel function has returned to normal, have the same bowel function the day prior to surgery. Another, you know, 30 or 35% would say, you know, I used to go once a day. Now I have two bowel wounds a day, but I didn't even think about it until you just mentioned it. The last five to 10% can have a more frequent um, uh, time with bowel movements. And those patients are typically those that had an issue with diarrhea or loose stools prior to surgery. And you just, you, by removing the colon, you exacerbate the situation. And the reason for that is the colon is basically a giant sponge that absorbs water. And so when you have less colon around to absorb water, what passes through is more watery and therefore the stool is more watery. And if you do have surgery for diverticulitis, will you never get it again? Great question. Odds are no, but nothing in surgery or nothing in medicine is 0%, fortunately. Um, so you can, there are two ways that you can, um, two typical ways that you can have another episode of diverticulitis. One is if part of the sigmoid colon was not completely removed or you got diverticulitis in another area, maybe in the descending colon just above the sigmoid colon, you also can get diverticulitis in the cecum or the right side of your colon, but that is much rarer. And what do you see on the horizon in terms of treatment, either medical or surgical, for diverticulitis in the future? Yeah, the interesting thing about diverticulitis is it's such a prevalent common disease that we know so little about in terms of what causes it and why it keeps happening and growing. There are a lot of genetic and environmental factors that are being uh, investigated now, and there are some good studies going on trying to figure out, is there a big genetic component? How can we target patients and really individualize uh, treatment to make things better? So I think really fleshing out what the genetic component of diverticulitis is going to be a big part of the future. Great. Well, I'm sure patients are um, happy to have you take care of them if, if they need you for this uh, problem. And uh, we thank everyone for joining us on MD Insights today.